Okay, so um, my name is Tim Foskett. Uh, can you hear me all right? No. I think this is a bit too far away. How about that? Yeah? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, I just wanted to acknowledge the enormous contribution that you've made to the field of gay men, uh, amongst many others. Uh, it was amazing to sort of see what pink therapy is doing out there and, uh, um, and the commitment to the diversity of gay men and other GSRDs as well. So. Um, I'm here because um, I've worked a lot around intimacy with bi and gay men over many years. Um, first of all at PACE, uh, running the group work program for bisexual and gay men for 13 years as a manager and then another six as, a, as one of the workers on it. So I've listened to a lot of uh, bi and gay men in London talk about sex, love, relationships and so on. Um, I also set up an organisation called Loving Men with Alfred Hurst and Dennis Carney. Um, we run events and retreats and develop resources around intimacy. Um, and I work in private practice with large numbers of bi and gay men in groups and individually. So um, I guess that's why Dominic invited me to come and talk about this. Um, <coughs> I'm, a, I'm a slow flow person on a Saturday morning and to do this in 20 minutes requires reasonably speedy staccato. So um, this, I'm on an edge, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. <laughs> Um, and just a, a word about gay men and, uh, and homogeneity. Obviously, we're not a homogenous population by any means. We're extraordinarily diverse. So I'm going to talk about gay men. Um, obviously, the ways in which the issues of race, class, HIV, age combine with some of the issues I'm going to talk about are immense and important. Um, and obviously, there are lots of men who don't identify as gay for whom a lot of this is relevant. So I just wanted to kind of add that, that note to using the word gay as we, do, as we go over the day. Um, I want to start with some information about some of what we know about gay men from research. Um, it's a fairly, it's a jigsaw of research. There's not coherent research about gay men because nobody funds that. But there has been quite a lot of research around sexual health. And from that, we can draw some conclusions. So. Um, this, uh, <coughs> this report uh, is written by Sigma. Sigma is a, a London-based research organisation, done loads of research with, around gay men in the UK. Um, and this is the most recent one that they've done, where they surveyed 15,000 gay and bi men across the country in all sorts of different ways, using Facebook mainly and uh, hookup sites. 44% um, of those 15,000 gay men were currently in a steady relationship with one or more men. Um, that, in interestingly, is, is covered by lots of other research which shows at any one time from now until the 1970s, about 40 to 50% of gay men will say that they're in a steady relationship of some kind. I think that's just an interesting finding in terms of some of the stereotypes that m go around. Of the 15,000 men that Sigma talked to, 72% had one steady partner, 15% had two, and 13% had three or more. This isn't to say that steady partners is the only way to have intimacy. It's just some information about some of the relationship and intimacy patterns that gay, some gay men do. Again, talking a little bit about civil partnerships and gay marriage is not the only way to do intimacy, but it's interesting information. We know that in the first six years of civil partnerships between 2005 and 2011, 50,000 men entered into civil partnerships with each other in this country. We know that that was five times what the Labour government who introduced the legislation anticipated the take-up would be. Five times. Uh, we also know, interestingly, according to Wikipedia, that the, the uh, longevity rate for gay male civil partnerships is significantly higher than for female uh, civil partnerships during that period. 50% success rate for gay men, 65% failure rate for women, women civil partnerships in that period. Again, just interesting and different perhaps from a stereotype that we might have in our minds. Um, in the first 18 months of gay marriage, 7,000 men, that was between April 2014 and October 2015, 7,000 men got married to each other. Um, we know something about uh, the patterns of relationships that some gay men have. Um, we know from a whole series of studies, a lot from the States, but not just from the States, some in Europe, that 
on average, about 70% of ongoing gay male relationships have some kind of consensually open agreement. 70%. Um, that means that about 30% have a monogamous agreement. So the diversity is the name of the game here. People do this in all kinds of different ways. There isn't one way to be intimate. But it's interesting that so many gay men opt for that. And that a, a very significant number of other gay men opt for, mon for a monogamous format. To quote one author, gay men have shown an extraordinary inventiveness and imagination in developing the ways we have intimate sexual relationships and the ways in which we pass on to each other the complex etiquettes we have developed. In this study of 86 uh, long-term open couples, a majority said that non-monogamy brought additional benefits beyond sexual, the, oops, the sexual outlet. Couples spoke of greater trust, more forthright communication, personal growth, increased perspective, and more drive in their own sex lives together. So, interesting things that we find when we talk to gay men about their experiences of different intimate, intimate organisations. A quote from Dave Nimmon's book, Soul Beneath the Skin, if you're interested in a, uh, a positive take on the contribution of gay men to society, uh, this is a very interesting research-based book that covers all sorts of things about the, the rather special creatures that gay men are. He says, much empirical evidence suggests that self-identified gay men are engaged in a striking range of cultural innovations in social practices. Our patterns of intimacy and interpersonal connectedness take new forms. We have distinct patterns of caretaking in sexual and communal realms. We are enacting new definitions of public, private, family and friends. We are pioneering a wide range of untried intimate relationships with new forms, rituals and language. So some gay men at least are clearly part of an extraordinary sexual and intimate revolution. I say this because through the le oh, why do I keep doing that? Through the lenses of homophobia, heterosexism and normative sexual conventions, <clears throat> it's easy to completely miss what gay men have crafted, worked at, developed and enjoyed over many decades. I have clients who are in complex, emotionally sophisticated, intimate relationships, but who don't necessarily recognize that, don't recognize what they're actually managing to achieve. Um, and I think it's important to point this out and to celebrate that, as well as talk about the more difficult stuff, which I'll come on to. Um, I also think this is an important backdrop to working with gay men who find intimacy difficult, or who think they find intimacy difficult. It's important to know that that's not the whole story. Certainly it's been an important part of my journey as a therapist to remember that not everyone that who I work with isn't necessarily representative of the whole story. Um, so now let's talk a little bit, the rest of the presentation really is about working with men who find intimacy difficult because those are the men that are likely to find their ways into our consulting rooms. Um, and in my experience, they're not likely to be feeling good about either themselves, about other gay men, about intimacy, about the possibilities, often, not always, but often. Um, this is a very big challenge for a lot of men, for reasons that I'm sure are obvious and that I'll talk about as well. Um, I want to start by looking at what they might mean by intimacy. I think it's a good question when people say they want more intimacy. What, what does that actually mean? So people say different things, but uh, often they're in these realms. So ongoing companionship of some kind, emotional closeness of some kind, an ongoing sexual relationship of some kind. And some people might get to, this, to the, the desire to be authentic, the desire to be real with somebody else in their world and to know somebody else at depth. Now, we don't have time to go the scenic route. So uh, to take a leap, um, and I, I imagine as many of us are therapists, um, we know that these things require quite a lot. And I think that's part of what happens in therapy is that we support people to start to understand what really is involved in intimacy. And for a lot of, a lot of men and a lot of gay men, that isn't obvious. So intimacy probably requires some emotional awareness and sensitivity, uh, a willingness to be vulnerable. Skills for handling fears of abandonment, of rejection, of feeling overwhelmed, of fears of feeling pain of some kind, and fears around difference and conflict and how those things will be managed. I want to just go back to the first list the, on, the, on the, that side of the room. Um, not everyone wants all of these things. 
And some people just want companionship and maybe a bit of sex, and they're not very interested in sharing their subjective world with another man. Um, other people do want the whole, pi the whole package or more of the package. And I think in, in working with people, it's really good to establish gently with them what it is that they're interested in, in an intimate relationship. Um, quite just a quote from John Rowan, who's written a book called Healing the Male Psyche. Men have been socialized to believe that showing feelings is a weakness and leads to, be taken, leads to being taken advantage of and losing something. In some cases, men do not have to, a vocabulary for emotions at all and cannot identify them or express them in part because of this. So the challenge is given the social conditioning of men. On top of this, intimacy for a lot of us, for most people, real intimacy is scaring, scary. This is a great book. If you're interested in the nuts and bolts of intimacy, uh, it's an old book, but she really knows her stuff and she writes very compellingly and, and accessibly. Uh, <coughs> Betty Burzon, no longer with us, sadly. Um, she writes a few things. Most of us need to exercise some control over how close we allow others to get to us at any given time. This is a key area to work with with people. Intimacy involves the ability to allow another close enough to know you without pretense, guardedness or restraint. It can be wonderfully affirming and, and a perilous gamble. You open yourself up to another, you let your defences down, you may be hurt purposefully or inadvertently. You're exposed to the vagaries of, hu of the human conscious. Anything can happen. So, deep breath. If we want to help men who find this difficult, where might we start? This is a, an, I, a, an idea that I picked up from a therapist called Ken Page. He works out of uh, New York City. Um, and he talks about the intimacy journey. Um, the idea that each person is on a journey around intimacy and that each uh, encounter of intimacy, whether it lasts 20 minutes or 20 years, uh, there's learning, there's a clue in that, probably for the next step. Uh, this is really helpful for people that feel that they've failed in every single way, because usually they haven't. Usually they've learnt quite a few lessons, and usually they've been very brave at different points in their life, not, not least in taking the first steps, whatever they were, to make contact with other men in an intimate sexual way. Uh, and this is a way of acknowledging that journey. Um, these are some things that people sometimes find out on their intimacy journey. So uh, just a few examples to give some life to it, that perhaps that we learn that controlling somebody else or trying to control somebody else doesn't work, that opening up helps, that too much compromise ultimately makes me feel resentful, that intimacy shows up in surprising places. Just a few examples. Um, it's also a really good tool for deconstructing the concept of intimacy itself. Uh, to ask people about their intimacy journey. Um, and that we, those conversations might lead to dis the discoveries such as intimacy isn't something that only happens in long-term relationships, um, that it can happen in short-term encounters, that it can happen with friendships, it can happen with strangers or colleagues, that we can't really be intimate with another unless we're intimate with ourselves in some way, that there's an intimacy journey with the self to pursue. Um, and that we, the realisation that we have the choice to be more or less uh, open and intimate in certain situations or more or less defended and guarded, that we have those choices. A lot of people think that intimacy is something out there that they have to grab. I like to talk about it as something internal, like a gear change, like a, a choice to be an intimate person, uh, which is a much more empowering model, I think. <coughs> so... Um, on this journey with clients, I usually find that there's some inner work that needs to be done and there's some outer work. I think of it as the vertical axis, the internal work of their own relationship to themselves, and the horizontal axis, the interpersonal, what I might need to learn about or practice if I want to be more intimate with other people. So we'll just go through some of the things that come up on those two axes. Uh, the first bullet point here, Hello, Is There Anybody In There, is a lyric from a song that I really like. And I think this is a really big challenge for gay men, uh, for many of us anyway. We've learnt, we've learnt very well to suppress what's inside uh, and not to disclose what's inside. So getting to know what's going on inside is a really big thing. So self-awareness. Um, I came across a word recently, the emergent self and the emergent relationship. 
that if we're really to be intimate, then what we're interested in, interested in is, our, is the self that is emerging, that's changing every day uh, of ourselves and then in somebody else. And that takes self-awareness skills. There's a whole chapter on shame, internalised depression, self-esteem issues. Um, these two books are probably well known to people here. Um, clients find them accessible. Some get quite evangelical about them. Um, the Velvet Rage and Straight Jacket. Um, one, one thing about self-esteem, shame and internalised depression is it's a, really, it's a particularly important area where the different oppressions intersect with homophobia and heterosexism. So issues of racism, issues of classism, issues of ageism all combine and compound with each other and all need to be unpacked in different ways. Uh, no, not that way, that way. Um, so that leads me to core strengths and, and, and gifts. We talked a bit about strengths-based work yesterday. Um, the intimacy journey is a way of identifying some strengths. Uh, a lot of gay men arrive with a poor opinion of themselves and actually they've achieved a great deal just by being in a room with a therapist talking about intimacy. So looking at what their strengths are and what Ken Page talks about, the, the core gifts. What are the special things that they are actually bringing and contributing to the world? And the irony is that often th some of those are deeply, sh people feel deeply ashamed of the actual special thing that they have to bring. I I'll use sensitivity as an example. I think a lot of gay men are, not all gay men, but a lot of gay men are particularly sensitive men in the world. There's quite a lot of research in Dave Niman's book that would support that. A lot of gay men are ashamed of that, par that part of themselves, and yet that is actually one of the gifts that they might bring to intimate relationships. So the work of taking what we might be ashamed of and breaking it open and seeing the beauty in that is a really important vertical, part of the vertical axis of work. Self-soothing skills. Uh, again, yesterday we talked a bit about self-regulation, emotional self-regulation. I don't think it's possible to really be intimate with somebody unless we can handle some feelings. Feelings come up when we get close. And one of the reasons that some of us hold a great deal of distance with, with, from other people is because we don't want to deal with the feelings that come up. So, so there's a whole array of skills to support people to, to learn how to soothe difficult feelings when they come up in, in intimate relationships. And the research from neurobiology, interestingly, is, is showing that, um, that, that I, I hesitate to use the metaphor because I, I have slight problems with it, but I'll go there. So the idea that in intimate relationships we, we trigger quite a lot of child level responses. That we don't have a lot of, we don't have the same amount of ad reasonable adult accessible in intimate relationships. So if that's true, if intimate relationships trigger child level responses, then again we need to know how to soothe, how to be with ourselves when we are triggered in those ways. Um, and the last one is understanding how you push intimacy away. So this is a really helpful question for a lot of people, is to, to imagine that intimacy, that connection is trying to find you. We are social animals, we need connection, so we are looking for that. But most of us in, in various con conscious and unconscious ways are, are holding that at, at arm's length. And in the therapy relationship, you will be getting a lot of information about how somebody does that. And I think there's a great deal of scope for using the intimacy in the relationship to educate them about how you experience them and how you're experiencing them holding you at bay sometimes. Yeah. Not to shame them, but to educate them about some of the mechanisms that they might be using. Uh, just a reference to some resources that are on the Loving Men website. Um, <clears throat> in particular, the one furthest away from me on your left, Getting Ready, these are th the top three are three workbooks that we wrote actually when I was working at Pace about relationships, uh, self-esteem and sex. The first one has all kinds of work, uh, exercises and uh, uh, chat about um, this kind of work, self-esteem and um, feelings and getting ready for relationship. The other ones are great too and that's on the Loving Men website. So just moving on to the horizontal access, the interpersonal. Three minutes left. Okay, I think we're good. We're going to get there. <coughs> I'll risk a cough. Um, <laughs> so, <coughs> I'm sharing your inner world. This is a big deal for men. We're not trained to do this. 
So, and then we want to be intimate. You know, if you, thought, if you tried to create a program that would discourage people from being intimate, then the project of masculinity for the last thousands of years is, is that program. So le just learning how to share what's going on is a big skill. Skills for getting close, listening, empathy, attunement, important skills. Conflict repair and rupture skills. This is, sorry, rupture and repair skills. This is a big area for a lot of people. They, they don't expect to have to deal with, with conflict. I don't know why they don't. I don't know what life has taught them that they don't. But they expect to fall in love and it will be happy. And actually, we know that intimacy happens at these points of conflict and rupture and repair. So learning how to repair happens a lot in my groups. I think it's a really special format for that. Relationship format negotiation. By that I mean, uh, are we going to be open? Are we going to be closed? What are the rules? What are the agreements? How do we do all of that? There isn't a simple model to follow. This is what the they conclude. Couples don't know ahead of time what will surface or what will be required. They may be challenged by any and probably many of the following. Clarifying values and making certain that they are mutual. Appreciating ac and accommodating differences. Holding steadfast to agreements and commitment to honesty growing greater capacity to process and manage their own emotional reactions, learning to voice their desires, concerns, and uncomfortable feelings, becoming increasingly vulnerable, trusting, and forgiving, partnering to constructively problem solve and find resolution for unforeseen and possibly highly charged issues. So this was what they found that these non-monogamous couples were doing. For me, that's actually a, a manifesto for an intimate relationship, whether it's monogamous or not. Um, the last thing that they found, which I think is fascinating, is that couple, really sophisticated couples no longer had one rule for the couple. They had one rule for you and one rule for me that was tailored to the needs and sensitivities of those individual people. So really interesting findings. OK, close but not too close, interdependence. This is if you want the full package. If you want sex and love and intimacy and honesty and authenticity, there seems to be something, and Esther Perel talks about it very well, so does David Schnark in his book, it seems to be something about not going for this, but finding a way to do this, um, to, to be separate from each other. She says, I suggest our ability to tolerate our separateness and the fundamental insecurity it engenders is a precondition for maintaining interest and desire in a relationship. Instead of always striving for closeness, I argue that couples may be better off cultivating their separate selves. If cultivating separateness sounds harsh, let's think of it instead as nurturing a sense of selfhood. Love enjoys knowing everything about you. Desire needs mystery. It's hard to generate excitement, anticipation, and lust with the same person you look to for comfort and stability. I invite you to think of ways you might introduce risk to safety, mystery to the familiar, and novelty to the enduring. OK, last quote, and then it's a stop. This is a letter from Christopher Isherwood to Gore Vidal in 1948. The success of same-sex relationships is revolutionary in the best sense of the word. And because it demonstrates the power of human affection over fear, prejudice, and taboo, it's actually beneficial to society as a whole, as all demonstrations of faith and courage must be. They raise our collective morale. Okay.